Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Rich Hill. I'm the mayor of the village of Raleigh Beach, and welcome to our fireside chat for July of 2017. Uh, tonight, my guest is Sam Yingling. He's our state representative from the area here. Uh, Sam graduated from DePaul University of Chicago, studied public policy and administration and metropolitan land use, better known as urban planning, and political science. He's a former Avon Township Supervisor, past president of the Romney Area Chamber of Commerce, and served on the Romney Beach Cultural and Civic Center Foundation. He and his family are lifelong residents of the county of Lake County and have been small business owners for three generations. Well, welcome very much, Sam. Thank you for having me. We also have uh, some of our moderators tonight. Uh, we have uh, Daniel Recker from, uh, he's a junior at the University of Arizona studying civil engineering. We have uh, Alex, uh, is it Barty? Barty, yes. Barty? Uh, a freshman at the University of Illinois uh, studying computer engineering. And Jacob Langor, uh, he's a junior at the University of Iowa doing, studying sociology with criminology focus. I'm not sure what they teach them how to do crime from college, but you know, <laughs> study that some other day. Uh, welcome gentlemen, thank you for helping us out tonight. We appreciate that. And uh, we have a series of questions. You can begin any time. Uh, so for the first one, this is for Representative uh, Yingling. Can you please give us an overview of the geographic boundary of the district you were elected to serve? Absolutely. Conveniently, I have a map here next to me. <laughs> the, um, the geographic area is essentially the Round Lake area and the Grays Lake area. It includes, um, parts, it includes Wildwood, um, a little part of Gurnee, and uh, part of Wakanda, but the main portion of the district, which makes up about 80% of the district, is the Round Lake and Grace Lake area. Okay, thank you. Sure. This next question is for the both of you. Um, what first inspired you to run for public office? Well, of myself, I started out with the Round Lake Area Chamber of Commerce, actually. I was the president there, and I uh, got asked to be on the park to support the commissioners. That was a lot of fun, enjoyed it. And then the village of Raleigh Beach went some, under some changes with the new uh, uh, mayor and village board. And there were some concerns from some people, some residents that asked me to get involved. I went to a meeting, was very shocked to see how poor the finances were. Uh, they had a budget of about $6 million, and they were about $1.25 million off in their budgeting. So that's huge. <clears throat> and they're already four months into their budget. So I decided, yes, okay, I'm going to run. And uh, eventually it came out, yes, that's right. You're, we are really screwed here, and we had to slash and burn the budget. And then uh, this continued to move up in the village here. I became mayor in 2001 with the support of all the trustees. And a real great staff. I have good trustees. It's a real pleasure working here and uh, serving the residents of Round Lake Beach, and sometimes the greater Round Lake area for that matter. And it was kind of happened by accident. I kind of got pushed into it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing I ever thought about doing in my whole life. But, but I love it. That's, I actually never realized that you used to be on the uh, the Park District yes. Board. Yeah. So was that what um what years were that was like that? Ninety two, uh, no, ninety three, ninety four, ninety five. Oh wow! Okay, I never knew that. Um, I got I actually kind of had a similar start as um the mayor did in uh, I used to be the uh, president of the Round Lake uh, uh, Area Chamber of Commerce, and um, during that time there was a lot of concern being brought to me um, by business members about the property tax assessments. Um, so I started to look into what was going on over at the township, and I began to realize just kind of how dysfunctional our property tax system is here in the state, and how um, subjective and regressive the system is. And it was disproportionately dumping, um, I would argue, uh, the tax burden on a lot of the businesses here uh, locally. So as I started to look into that, I also realized just how much uh, overspending was going on at the township. Um, that incentivized me to run for uh, for township supervisor. Um, I, was, uh, I was elected township supervisor, and then I was able to cut the taxes there by about 22%. Um, but in doing so, I realized that, you know, we're just really dealing with one tax levy on our property tax bill that has multiple, you know, some people have as many as 20 different taxing entities on their tax bill. Um, and I realized that we needed to have systemic change to our overall property tax system, and that's what um, in encouraged me to run for um, the House of Representatives um, where we could, where I would have the ability to affect change as it pertains to property taxes. Um, so that's how I ended up where I'm at right now. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, this question is uh, for both of you. Um, one of the purposes of these five-sided chats is to educate the public on how leaders on all levels of government work together in delivering services to those individuals that they mutually represent. In your roles as representative and mayor, how do you cooperate uh, in servicing those individuals who have been elected to serve? Well, I, I, I think we're probably going to give the same I answer. Say that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, 
The, um, you know, I think after seeing what happened, um, you know, with the flooding issue here locally, yeah. is that when you have a disaster um, of this magnitude, is that that requires um, elected officials from all um, units of government to be working together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it starts on the local level, level where Mayor Hill is at, along with um, his staff and his team, to be able to address the immediate needs of the residents here in town. Um, but as, as things start to, to uh, progress further down the road, is that you know, then I become involved and I, I actually was on the phone with, um, with the village administrator today for Round Lake Beach, discussing um, getting relief from the Illinois Emergency Management Association and how then that would translate into trying to get FEMA relief. Right now, in, um, in order for our area to qualify for FEMA, uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, for FEMA relief, we're going to need to um, be able to show the federal government that we've um, incurred about a little over $18 million in uninsured losses. And that's going to be very important for people in our community, especially for people who um, have been adversely affected by the flooding. And this will be, a, this will be um, as much as we would like to resolve it immediately, this will be a, an issue that will continue on for the months ahead. And I think that that's a, a really great immediate example of how we all work together in our various capacities. Yeah, absolutely. And the, this kind of situation is where we have to pull together. It's like neighbors pull together to get things done and accomplished. Uh, but we also work together on other issues. Or when you guys are doing the budgeting, you're looking at different projects throughout the area mm -hmm. that are possibilities that we can target that, that would have the biggest impact in the community. And uh, you know, we would discuss it and come up with the, the best possible ones. And you've been uh, good at getting us uh, funding for some of those things. That, that's been great. Uh, talk once in a while on the different issues as far as regulations or whatever. And try, try to, again, make it best for the residents and the businesses. And that, that's what we do together. You know, we try to. Well, work together, I guess. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> simple, yeah. simple answer. Yeah. Good question. That's a great question. Thank you. So you started to touch on already how there's like a pressure to act immediately. So what keeps you motivated to keep helping the public and how do you handle the stress from the public? Is that for either one of us or? Yeah. Okay. Rich, would you? Well, I don't have too much stress from that though. I, I look I look forward to helping the public when there's a disaster, but when there's a disaster, I'm glad I am able to help the public. Uh, that's what I'm being elected to do. And as a leader, that's what you do. You step up there and you help people. Yeah. If it stresses you out too much, you shouldn't be in that role. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not good for you. Uh, and yes, sometimes it can be frustrating, but not so stressful. I can say it's more frustrating because you hit that end sometimes. You have areas you just can't address. You can't, you know, the equipment, don't have the manpower, don't have the money, and you can't do everything that you'd like to do. But overall, it's a great feeling when you can accomplish something to help those people, and that's why I keep doing it. Yeah, absolutely. I think as, long, you know, as an elected official, you have to recognize that you have to work with a lot of other people and that you're not the only person who is making the decisions. It's, you know, being in a legislative body where I'm at, is you know, I have to be able to work cooperatively with a bunch of other people from around the state. So you have to be able to recognize that you, know, you might have an idea and you might have what is viewed to be a, an, a pressing need that you want to solve immediately. But as long as you recognize the fact that the process takes time and, you're, and, you, and you accept that, it, it, doesn't create, it doesn't create a stress or a need for um, you know, urgency, because I think you can then, you can equally articulate that to the people you represent. Listen, you know, we're working on this and it will take some time. And people are, are understanding of that. And they understand that, especially in the governmental process, that things can sometimes be an elongated process. And it is frustrating, especially when, you know, things aren't moving as quickly as you'd like. But, um, but I think people recognize that that is part of our democracy and that's how our democracy is, is intentionally designed. Okay, thank you. This next question is for you, Representative Yingling. Um, House representatives run for office every two years. With such a short election cycle, how does a House representative balance the need for conducting state business with the pressures of the election calendar? You know, I, I, that's a great question. I think it's a very timely question, too, because in our, in our era of immediate response, in our, area of, in our era of social media, where there is, you're constantly having to address ongoing information. Um, it's, we have, I, and I, I think this has happened almost at a national, I think this has happened at a national level, and I think we're starting to see it happen at a localized level, where there is, with um, media influences, is, it, it sometimes feels as though you are constantly in a state of campaigning 
which I think is a very unfortunate um, byproduct of, of kind of how our society has advanced. Um, you need to find a balance. You need to find a balance and recognize, you know, there are times when I get calls from people saying, you know, Sam, you need to respond to this attack that someone's made on you. And, my res and, and the way I handle that is saying, you know, that's, it's not campaign season. You know, campaign season is, a, is a, in my opinion, a set few months before the election. That's when you go out and you make your case to voters that this is why you should elect me. This is what I've done. This is what I intend to do. That's your window of opportunity. Anything outside of that is designed and should be solely used for governing. And I, unfortunately, I think in um, our country, in our state, is that um, people have forgotten that governing is a main part of the job and that the campaigning is really just a few months of the overall cycle. It is, it's difficult, it's a, it's, it's a difficult balance, but I think as long as, you know, my personal philosophy is when the campaign's over, it's over, and um, then it's time to govern. And I will, and I will function as, as a legislator in a governing capacity up until the campaign has to start, you know, two years from that point. Yeah, with the 24-7 uh, news cycle nowadays, yeah. everything's out there constantly. And uh, instant news from around the world, something happens. It used to be you hear a little bit from here, a little bit from there. Now you hear everything from everywhere. And people re want to respond to it, they want to react to it. And unfortunately, we get caught up in that sometimes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great way of saying it, the 24-hour news cycle. I think you're absolutely right about that. Absolutely. Uh, Representative Yingling, uh, you have had the pleasure of serving as both a township supervisor and now as a house representative. How do the roles differ? Any, are there any similarities? So, that's, that's a really good question. So as a township supervisor, um, I was the executive of the township. I was the CEO of the township. Um, so, I, so the role of an executive is a lot different than what the role of a legislator is because now I'm in a legislative body, I'm not the CEO, I'm not an executive, I have to work collaboratively with a bunch of other legislators. So there is, there is a very unique difference between the two. Um, there's one where you, you basically are the boss and there's another one where you are um, participating with other members elected, you know, equally elected members from around the state. Um, with the uh, with the township is um, you know I I don't believe um, after serving as township supervisor um, I came to the realization that township government is redundant and duplicative and should be consolidated into the county that didn't make me very popular amongst my other elected township officials when I publicly announced that um, that we need to get rid of township government uh, so that's been so that's been a little bit of a a little bit of an interesting exercise because I've been the um, leader of government consolidation and specifically township consolidation. So I basically now am in a role to try and get rid of the previous role I was in. Thank you very much. Sure. And I also have a question for Mayor Hill. Uh, you have also had the pleasure on serving as a Park District Commission, Village Trustee, and now as Mayor. How did those various roles differ? Well, as Sam just said, uh, there are two different uh, ones legislative where you are actually reading through the material, you're voting with your, your colleagues. Uh, and I, I view the mayor position as a little bit different. Uh, you said the boss, I would call him more of a coach. Because what I'm really doing is I'm working with my trustees, get them all on the same page, inform them about what's good about this, what's bad about that, in my opinion at least. And if they differ, I get their opinion back. And we can share that among each other. I try to set a vision for the future of Raleigh Beach and what's best for the residents. Uh, where we have issues right now that we can address, where we have issues that we want to address, but <laughs> we have to come up with a funding plan for it. And that's why right now we have you know, a 10 year plan in place and uh, we've been, uh, you know, knock on wood, been very lucky to be able to achieve most of that in the last five years, and hopefully the next five years we'll do the same thing. Uh, last year alone we were able to do 10 miles of road repaving, which was huge for us. Uh, but I, again, that's what I see it as. One is you're making the decisions based off the information given to you more so. And the other one, you're giving the information and coaching them and getting them all on the same team to move your village forward or the township or the state. Thank you. Representative Yingling, the state has been without a budget for two years. Just last week, the Senate legislator approved a new budget. How far do you think the new budget goes in helping to address the state's fiscal woes? So the state was without a budget for, well, we were entering the third year um, before the General Assembly overrode a gubernatorial veto to implement a budget. Uh, operating without a budget is a very dangerous territory. Um, in order to, um, the General Assembly uh, uh, primary responsibility is to appropriate the funds that the executive of the state, being the governor, asked to be appropriated. Um, what happened in the state of Illinois 
is um, our budget crisis initially started in 20, let me make sure I got this right, 2015. And that's when the governor initially vetoed the budget package that the General Assembly had sent him. Um, after that happened, there were not enough votes to override the, uh, the governor's veto in the, in the legislative body. Um, so that ended up creating a situation where the spending taking place in this state was primarily court um, under court supervision. So we had a, the third branch of government in our system basically running the government. You, you had the court system authorizing payments that really the General Assembly and the, um, and the governor should have come to an agreement on. Um, it is very important that we now have this budget. It, it stabilizes the state. Um, in the absence of that budget, it, we, um, the state acquired about 15 billion, billion with a B, B as in boy, of unpaid bills. That's gonna take some time to, to dig out of. The most pressing issue um, that was facing the General Assembly in terms of overriding the, the governor's veto and implementing a budget was the fact that our bond rating was about to get downgraded to junk bonds. Um, that would have created a debt spiral in the state of Illinois. Um, essentially what that means is that mutual funds and pension systems that hold Illinois debt would have been forced to sell Illinois debt because it went to junk bond status, which would have meant there would have been a massive offloading of Illinois debt onto the markets, in addition to then whatever bonds that the state itself was trying to float new bonds, and it would have uh, created what's called a debt spiral. Um, and that would have been an absolute travesty. It would have cost us more in the long run had that happened. Um, so having a budget stabilizes the state, but there's still a lot more work that needs to be done. And Mayor Hill, what impact does the state's new budget have on the village? Uh, it won't be terribly bad. Uh, they did make some changes in the uh, share of the income tax, the uh, local government distributed fund. They're going to be cutting at 10% this year, but they're also going to be accelerating the payments. So we'll get 14 payments this year instead of 12 payments. So kind of balance out what we get during the 12 calendar months. Uh, but we should have gotten those earlier anyway. Just, it's been something we've been working on for a long time with the, the payment system instead of going all the way through the General Assembly, through the state, blah, blah, blah. And where you finally get the money, now it's going to be put directly in the fund right. and it'll be distributed within 60 days, which will be really nice. We'll be counting the money every month. We won't have to worry about it. what's going on in Springfield. So that'll be a big improvement. Uh, some things that I, I would like to see is, uh, you know, a better, uh, some changes down in Springfield as far as the, the pensions go. I know they did some things a few years ago, but I think there's more that needs to be done in order to really bring our state uh, I guess better economically uh, positioned for, uh, for business community out there. It's just so high taxes right now. I hear that all the time when I talk to my businesses. Right. And you've talked to them too. Oh, right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, this next question is for both of you, but uh, you touched on it earlier, Representative Yingling. Uh, the issue is property taxes. Property taxes are a big issue in the state of Illinois. Individuals often cite high property taxes as the reason they move out of community, out of a community or the state. What are your collective positions on property taxes? Would you like to go first or would you like me? <laughs> sure, uh, you know, property taxes that uh, we all see our bill, there's oftentimes 15 different taxing bodies on your bill, and that's one of the biggest problems. Uh, you know, Sam mentioned earlier about consolidation. Uh, consolidation is great. Uh, there's a lot of good efforts out there. Uh, we're working with uh, 911 consolidation now uh, throughout the county. I'm on the county board, uh, been appointed by the county board to that committee and hopefully we can consolidate some of those. Years ago, the Round Lake area did consolidate our CENCOM uh, 911. So we had the four Round Lakes go into one, we had the Park District join us. Since that point, we've had the Barrington area join us, we have Antioch that's joined us, and that's really reduced our costs for 911. But we can help some other people reduce their costs. What I see more so is all these other districts that are out there everywhere. You know, we, we have, I was, I was on the Park District before, but we have the Fire District, we have the Library District, we have this district, that district, they're everywhere. And that's where you have all the different elected officials and you know, a person, even like myself, when you're voting for 15, 20 different people, it's like, you can, it's hard to, get to really find out who those people are. You know, what, what are they gonna do? What, what's their position? Right. You're just voting for somebody sometimes because they recognize the name. And, right. And that's probably one of the biggest problems with our state of Illinois right now. We need to reduce the number of elected officials mm -hmm. and put, I guess, maybe a bigger umbrella uh, over the same functions that we do now by all individual boards. The, in the state of Illinois, I. I the state of Illinois has a outdated tax structure. 
um, that needs to be brought up um, to properly represent the globalization of the world's economy and the U.S.'s economy. Uh, the state and local governments have primarily three revenue sources. You've got property taxes, you've got income tax, you've got sales tax. Out of those three taxes, that's where the bulk of the money is, is generated. That's where the bulk of the revenue to run the government is generated. Now, the problem with that is the fact that it doesn't have, it, it, our tax code is not diversified across the economic base. So you disproportionately are driving um, the tax burden to property taxpayers, which I would argue is, an, is a regressive and abusive um, system and form of taxation. When you look at our surrounding states, many of them have adjusted um, their tax structures 15, 20 years ago to properly represent the globalization of the world's economy and the changing economy here in the United States. Um, you know, if you look at uh, you know, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri, all of our surrounding states, they have transitioned and diversified their tax base. One of the things that I would like to do is I would like to see us transition away from a property tax centric system. And what we're talking about is implementing a new tax structure that takes that property tax money and equally spreads it out over the economy. When you think about property taxes as a whole, is that it's not based really upon one's ability to pay. It's a very subjective and abusive form of taxation. When your property taxes go up, Yes, it's a very complicated formulaic approach that's used and there's lots of people involved. So when you try and get answers, everyone's pointing their finger in opposite directions saying it's his fault, it's her fault. Don't blame me, it's the system's fault. Um, but what we do know is that the property taxes in the state of Illinois are driving people directly out of the state. It is the number one issue, I would argue, facing our district, facing our state, in terms of, it, I think it's, um, it's hampering economic growth and it's forcing people out of the state. So I would like to see the transition away from a property tax centric system um, into a more diversified tax base that can accommodate, um, it, that can accommodate the, the transfer of taxation. And I would agree with that because as you said right now, you have some rich districts, you have some poor districts right. and it, it, it really makes it difficult for a lot of people to live in Illinois properly and when you're on a fixed income, maybe you retire, you were paying $10,000 a year in property taxes, you can't afford to do that anymore. Right. <laughs> you gotta move. And you're absolutely right about that. And that's what we see too, which is, so, which is happening to our senior population, yes. is we've got people who, who raised a family here in town, who raised mm -hmm. a family in the area, their kids maybe live in the area, but now they're retired, they're on a fixed income, and their property taxes keep going up. And they are literally being forced out of their homes. Um, when you look at, you know, property taxes don't care whether you're retired, whether you're um, living on a fixed income, whether you're unemployed, that tax bill is coming every single year regardless, and you better find a way to pay for it. And, and so it creates a degree of insecurity, really, within our community. And, um, and I think that's in large part what forces people just across the border into Wisconsin, where they pay a lot. Um, they might pay maybe more in income tax, but they pay substantially less in on um, property taxes. Mm -hmm. So that was a great point, yeah. This question is for Representative Yingling. Um, the village of Round Lake Beach has a sizable inventory of aging housing stock that needs some revitalization. Over the years, the village has embarked on several neighborhood housing programs in an attempt to stabilize neighborhoods. In the last couple of years, the village has received funding from IHDA to assist it in its uh, efforts. With your background in real estate and urban planning, what do you see as the future of housing for Illinois or Lake County, and what programs does the state offer to assist in stabilizing uh, the redevelopment of aging communities? That's a really good question. The, um, That's a really long question. It's a, it's a long question, but it, it's, it, there's a lot in there. There's, um, there's a lot to discuss in there. I think, I think going back to the previous question is that property taxes in large part, um, they suppress the valuation of our homes. Because when somebody wants, when you put your house on the market, um, somebody can only afford to pay a certain amount, a fixed amount each month. And if half of that has to go to property taxes, that means that they, can aff they can't afford to pay as much for your house. So our property taxes are suppressing the valuation of our homes. And in many cases, someone's home is their largest capital investment that they will have in their lifetime. In many cases, that someone's retirement plan is the equity that's built up in their home. So that's in, in large part, I think, what hurts our overall housing market. Here in Round Lake Beach, 
to more specifically to your question, you know, the village has run, um, you've gotten a number of awards from some of the programs that, yes. you, that you've run in terms of revitalization of the neighborhoods and especially taking into account the older housing stock that we see here um, in the older part of Round Lake Beach and the older parts of the other Round Lakes. Um, I think there is definitely um, room for additional grant money to help uh, local communities revitalize. One of the things, one of the push and pull on that issue is there are some people who believe there is a school of thought that says that, that the private sector should deal with that. The, that should be driven by the private sector, redevelopment, investment in um, real estate and other economic investments should be privately driven by the market. And there are some people who say, you know, yes, that's all fine and good, but the government should invest some money and provide some benefits to stimulate that investment. And I think you can, you can find a nice hybrid of the two. Um, right now in the state of Illinois, obviously money is not um, growing on trees. And, um, but in the future, I think it's something that the state should invest in in helping um, local communities revitalize. I mean, and, and I think using the model here that Round Lake Beach has built over the years would be a really good prototype to, uh, to launch statewide. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. You know. <clears throat> We prefer to have private companies come in to remodel, sell the house, that's great. But there's some houses that just become so dilapidated, they either need to be torn down mm -hmm. or they, they cost so much to remodel them that the private guy's not going to touch it. He's oh, that's going to cost me too much. So that's where the village has to step in, either tear the place down or hire somebody to remodel it. And we come pretty close to breaking even on those, uh, those issues. So it's not like we're just wasting taxpayers' money, but we're putting the house back on the market that they pay property taxes again. Yeah. They're going to have the village services. They're going to shop in town. So it does create that cycle of money going around town. And so increasing the EAV, the yes. collective EAV, absolutely. There was a program, I think, a number of years ago, and I mean, talking about local issues, tying local issues to this specific question, is that I believe there was money from FEMA that allowed, that was provided to local municipalities to buy up homes that were in floodplains. Yes. Um, to be able to, to buy those up and, and, and remove those from the floodplain, which later on would save money. So there are other programs like that that I think we should be, we should be looking at as well. Yeah, we still work with uh, Lake County Stormwater Management on okay. that also. Okay, great. Representative Yingling, your family has been longtime business owners in the Round Lake area, and as you know, the Round Lake area business community was hit hard by the recession of 2008. Large businesses suspended expansions or closed stores. Small business owners seemed to be hit the hardest. It seems that the larger companies often get the tax incentives or revenue share agree sharing agreements. Mm -hmm. Just recently, the village became aware of a local business suspending expansion plans in the county, choosing instead to accept incentives from the state of Wisconsin to move a portion of their business to a community in Racine County. As a member of the House, what items or issues are being discussed to encourage and retain small businesses in Illinois? You know, you brought up a really good point about um, the focus that I think the federal government and the state government has taken in terms of helping businesses. There's always this big focus on let's help the biggest businesses. Let's give them the tax incentives. But what, what I think a lot of times people fail to recognize is that those big businesses at one point were very small businesses. And they were the small businesses run in our, in our local economies. They were the small businesses, the mom pop shops. Um, Illinois has been terrible in terms of providing any sort of assistance for small businesses. Um, they, uh, the, the policy in Illinois for decades really has been um, helping larger corporations. And we've seen massive abuses by these larger corporations, specifically through the use of the edge tax credit, where they will take the money and then leave. Um, you know, the state will say, here, here's all this tax money, stay in the state of Illinois. They say, okay, great, we're going to take that money, and then they, they move their facilities to another state. Um, and there's a, there's a couple points that I want to discuss about just the overall dysfunctionality of that, is with, we made some changes to the edge tax credit, and I want to come back to that point. But before those changes were made, companies essentially, they couldn't go to the state and say, hey, listen, we'd really like to stay in the state. We're having a little bit of difficulty. Can we work out some type of revenue agreement or revenue sharing agreement to help us grow or to help us finance an expansion? The only way they could get state help is if they could show they were actively looking in another state to move. So basically, we were telling our companies, we want you to actively go out there and start looking in other states and then come back to us and tell us you're looking in those other states and then we're going to help you out with a tax incentive. Well, the danger in doing that is when you have a company actively looking in other states, you've got these other states saying, oh, hey, listen, come to our state. We're going to give you all of these incentives. And all of a sudden you've got companies starting to think, 
yeah, maybe we should actually move to that state. So that was a huge problem with, with our edge tax credit, which has been addressed at this point. We've also changed, we've also passed legislation out of the House that puts in place what's called a clawback provision. So if we do help a company and they do get tax incentives based upon commitments they make to the state and they leave, there's a clawback provision where the state gets that money back. But also, too, in the changes that have been now made to the edge tax credit, it expands it to middle and small, uh, middle sized and small businesses as well. And that's designed to help offset costs for expansion at the smaller level. And really, when you think about it, small businesses, when they go to expand, that, that isn't, that isn't, that's more than just a business decision. That's a personal decision mostly made by the sole proprietor of that business. That's a decision that that sole proprietor makes. Am I willing to put my house, my home, where my family lives up as collateral so I can expand my local business? I mean, that's a huge decision. A lot of times with these larger, you know, multinational corporations, it's whatever. I mean, they don't really have, they don't have skin in the game. It's, it's, um, and there's really no long-term consequences if, if their expansion fails, with the exception that the state of Illinois will have given them all this tax money. So changes made to the edge tax credit are incredibly important, um, and it eliminates a lot of those abuses, but then also expands it to medium and small sized businesses to provide them um, the ability to, uh, to expand as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. This next question is for both of you. Several months ago, Senator Tammy Duckworth participated in a roundtable discussion with local mayors in which the topic of infrastructure funding was raised. When it comes to public development and economic growth, infrastructure holds an essential role. As one of the building blocks of any municipality, investments into infrastructure cannot be overlooked. How can state and local governments ensure that proper funding is provided to these communities? Uh, well, that was a very good meeting. Uh, Senator Duckworth uh, listened to us and wrote, you know, took a bunch of notes back with her into her office and asked us to really consolidate all of Lake County's uh, needs as a whole and not kind of piecemeal here and there. And we had done that years ago with the transportation studies where we had all said, okay, this road's the worst. We'll all push for this road to be improved. And that kind of fell by the wayside probably five, six years ago. Everyone started getting their own stuff done again. But I think we need to look at that again and do more of a regional approach to some of the main infrastructure issues. Even with the flooding we just had, there's probably some regional issues we can work together on to help alleviate that if this happens again in another 20, 25 years. Mm -hmm. uh, but it all comes up with working together. And uh, the state doesn't have a lot of money, the federal government doesn't have a lot of money, so we've got to find ways to cut other costs or, or do something in order to make those funds available because we can't just keep doing nothing. That, that's not going to fix it. Yeah, and, and that's a great, I mean, really, the infrastructure is a lifeline for our economy. Yeah. And we see this, I mean, we see it here, we see it across the state. We see it in the Chicagoland area. We see it in very rural areas where those roads are the lifeline to get the agricultural yeah. materials to market. Um, with um, recently, the voters approved what's called, um, was commonly referred to as the uh, Safe Roads Amendment or the Lockbox Amendment. Um, that was approved in the November, of, uh, November election of 2016. And what that does now, that amended the Illinois state constitution and it mandates, it, it, it basically it puts all of the infrastructure funds into a lockbox. Uh, prior to that amendment being passed, those funds were often susceptible to being swept out for other functions. Um, so now the lockbox amendment's in place, which means that any tax revenue that's generated for the function of infrastructure investment cannot be touched unless it's designed for infrastructure. So I'm encouraged by that, and I'm also encouraged now that we, those revenue streams, those taxing streams that had been previously dedicated for infrastructure now, in fact, are guaranteed to be used for that. Thank you very much. We've been very lucky also here in, the, uh, in Ronald Lake Beach recently. The county did a $44 million project for the underpass over at Ronald Lake mm -hmm. That was a tremendous boost for our area. It's going to help our economy quite a bit. And that's also due to a sales tax, quarter percent sales tax that they received throughout the county that they've been able to use to do a lot of bonding. Right. They're doing their work over in uh, Washington right now. They're mm -hmm. going to pass there too, which is going to help them in the, in the long run. Uh, just to not have the train there every day, you know, 22 times a day stopping you. That's just the passenger trains plus all the freight trains. Uh, people zip right through there now. Right. That's helped tremendously. Uh, but there are a lot of other things that need to be done together, and we'll have to keep on working on that. You know, what's funny is I remember as a little kid when Rollins in 83 was a four-way stop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and now you see what it is. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, this question is for Representative Yingling. Um, 
In your role as representative, you serve on the Election and Administration Subcommittee and the Government Consolidation and Modernization Committee. Can you explain the role that each of the committees play in the development and drafting of legislation? Sure. Well, the um, so I'm the chairman of the Government Consolidation Committee in the House, and that's um, I, I primarily that's my my primary area of focus. Um, as as Mayor Hill mentioned earlier, and I strongly believe, we just simply have too many units of government in this state. We have more units of government in the state now than pr I would argue than any other yeah. um, state in the country. Uh, a new study came back, and this is what's even scarier: we can't actually identify how many units of government we have. That's how many we have. Um, a new study that came back shows that there are now potentially in excess of 8,000 units of government across the state. Um, and that's more than was ever projected before. But what's interesting, and, um, and we see this more in, um, in rural parts of the state, or in down in um, southern parts of the state, is where all of a sudden they discover, oh, we've got this unit of government that's been here. So my primary focus has been on government consolidation because, in my opinion, it increases efficiencies, um, it eliminates um, redundant services and duplicative services, mm -hmm. um, and I could spend I could spend three hours giving a presentation on government consolidation. Um, we passed. Um, I was the sponsor of House Bill 607 and Senate Bill 3, which are two major pieces of government consolidation legislation that have ever passed the General Assembly. Um, they are awaiting the, uh, uh, the governor's signature, so you know, we're hoping that he's going to sign those. Um, what that would do, that would allow for um, government consolidation at the township level. Um, it would allow for um, highway commissions that are no longer relevant at the township level to be eliminated. But most importantly, what it does is um, it expands what's commonly referred to as the, the DuPage consolidation model to every county in the state. Um, several years ago, uh, DuPage County came to the General Assembly and said, we want to be the guinea pig of consolidation. And so the General Assembly gave them a unique set of powers. Um, and it was, it, was, it was very controversial, and um, it barely passed out of the House. I think it passed with maybe a two-vote margin. Um, and they took that and gave DuPage County this ability to start to consolidate units of government, non-elected units of government. So it allowed them to consolidate that. Um, chairman Cronin, uh, the chairman of DuPage County, is um, projecting about $100 million savings now as a result of that. A couple years, uh, a couple years after that, um, Representative Jack Franks, who is now Chairman Jack Franks of McHenry County, and I expanded that model to McHenry County and Lake County. So McHenry County and Lake County recently, those powers recently went into effect for, for, um, uh, for Lake and McHenry County. In SB3, it expands those, pow uh, those powers to every county in the state. So it will start to provide an apparatus at the local level to start to consolidate. One of the um, positions of the Government Consolidation Committee in the state is that it recognizes the geographic diversity of the state. So whereas a unit of government up here to us could be completely irrelevant, it could be you know, the matter of life and death in the southern part of the state. So by empowering locals to make up their own minds to decide what units of government are best for them, what units of government work for their local communities, it has been the policy, and that's what SB3 and HB607 have done to administer that. Thank you. So re recently here in the Round Lake area, we had the Round Lake area sanitary district that was in place for mm -hmm. 50 years or so, but they haven't really done any sanitary service since they closed it and uh, opened a Fox Lake regional plant, I think, in the 70s. So the, the, they were still there was a taxing body. They didn't really have a tax levy, but they had money in their accounts, and they always met, and they paid their attorney, and uh, they were finally uh, agreed, and they uh, closed out everything. They uh, divested their... Uh, assets mostly to the county, uh, the, the sewer plant. We have our lagoons over there for excess flow, and that's just one gone already. So that, that's one good step. That's one. We're, yeah. <laughs> We're moving seven thousand nine hundred ninety-nine yeah. to go. <laughs> Representative Yingling, this question relates to your involvement with the Election Administration Subcommittee. With all the discussions in the national media concerning the integrity of the election process and potential for outside interference with the voting process, is, there something that, is this something that should be taken seriously? Also, is the state legislator considering, considering any type of legislation concerning the issue? So this is, this is definitely an emerging threat, and I think this is a threat that we actually haven't really, we're just starting to recognize. 
Um, what we do, uh, you know, what we know is that you know Russia did interfere with our November elections. Did they tinker with the results? Did they change the results? No, they didn't. But we know that they were successful in hacking into voter databases um, at various states. Illinois was one of the states that ended up getting hacked. So um, Russia has um, all, they have all of my voter data. They have all of everyone here's voter data. Now, how they choose to use that and if they choose to weaponize that in some form or another is, I would argue, a discussion for another day. But what we do know now is that um, our election system and our voter information is incredibly susceptible to cyber attack. And that's something that we're going to have to get our heads around and we're going to have to find a solution for it. Um, you're also talking about, in, in terms of securing that data and securing our, essentially, election networks, is going to take a huge amount of um, capital resources, human resources, and that is going to have to be arguably an issue that is generated um, at the federal level. This is going to have to be the federal government's initiative to help the states be able to provide the necessary security for their data um, at, the election, at, at the state level. One of the things that we're you know, we're fortunate uh, here in Illinois is that we don't have, if you will, a centralized election system where when the election results come in, they all go to a centralized computer and the computer tells us. We do have, and the counties are compartmentalized in their own systems. So there's, I often hear from people saying, well, what prevents an outside, what prevents a cyber attack from changing the outcome of the election, actually changing the number of votes? And, and that's in large part um, because we have the compartmentalization of our election results. We also have paper results. You know, we also have, have paper records. So I, I, I want to be careful. I don't, I don't want, I want to be careful in how we address this because I don't want, I don't think it's appropriate for people to think that at this point an outside influence could launch a cyber attack and actually change the vote totals of our elections. That's not the case. But what we do know for fact is that, um, that there are outside forces that have been successful in hacking and gaining control of our voter data. And, um, and that's something I, I think is, is a blatant warning shot. And if we don't listen to it, um, we're going to see long-term ramifications to our overall democracy. And the state of Illinois is in the infancy of, of addressing that at the state level. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think all the states had issues with that. Uh, Illinois didn't upgrade a lot of the computer systems mm -hmm. where they're supposed to. Lake County was pretty, pretty good back when they upgraded what they did, but they still had issues. And right. uh, that, that's a shame that that happened. But as the cyber wars is what they say the wars of the future are all going to be about. Mm -hmm. You hack data, you change data, you make things happen behind the scenes without putting a man in, in the ground. Right. And you can cause some severe problems. <laughs> and uh, let's hope we don't find out uh, how severe. Uh, but you're right, if they upgrade their system, the, the security networks that are out there nowadays can be done. A lot of this stuff, they're actually taken offline. Mm -hmm. it's, it's secure. You can't get to it without plugging into it directly. But then you have issues with certain people that'll plug in directly without uh, verifying the equipment they're plugging into it is not already in, been hacked and uh, has uh, malware on it or something. Right. So they're, they're, there's ways to go, but I think they're improving, and you're right, it's going to cost a lot of money to really protect mm -hmm. ourselves in the future, not just from Russia, but from China and right. uh, Korea and all those other places oh, like absolutely. that. Uh, absolutely. The Middle East, uh, they're yeah. beginning that too now. So, This next question is for both of you. Over the course of the last few years, Lake County has been studying the consolidation of E911 centers. This type of consolidation appears to be consistent with the state's efforts to encourage local units of government to cooperate in identifying services that can either be eliminated or consolidated. Do you have an opinion on the E911 consolidation, and what role do you think the state should play in facilitating the process or offering financial incentives? I, I think Rich has, has really hands-on experience with this one. I'll let you go first. Yeah, well, as I mentioned earlier, the Ronald Lake area was one of the leaders in consolidation of 911 systems. Uh, back in the late 80s, they put together uh, the Ronald Lake area and the uh, Ronald Lake Area Fire Department, the Ronald Lake Area Park District, and became CENCOM and dispatched. Uh, years later, they added uh, the Barrington area to it, which is a great addition to our CENCOM, and it helped reduce all of our costs even more. Uh, most recently, we added Antioch, and that helped reduce our costs even more. And we're at a point right now where we're about where the breaking point is, where if you grow much bigger, you're going to have more costs, and I'm not sure if we'll actually save any more money for what we're doing, but there's a lot of other communities out there that are individual still. They, they want to do their own. And there's so much misinformation as far as, well, this dispatchers won't know my town if they don't live in my town. Mm -hmm. Everything's on computers nowadays. It's all CAD. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the people don't 
if they live in your town, they don't know your whole town. Right. Uh, it, it, it's gone so far computerized right now. You could, a lot of places are being dispatched out of Glenview that are up here in Lake County, and that's even farther away. So I think there is a good need for it. Uh, we also need to harden our facilities more, and that's going to cost quite a bit of money. And if we do it as a cooperative all together, uh, that'll be cheaper for all of us. The new equipment coming out with the next generation 911, it's, it's even more high tech, and that's going to cost a lot of money to upgrade to those systems. So if we do it again cooperatively and in, in a bigger group, we can accomplish a lot more. Uh, the Starcom network that they're putting out there for changing all the radio frequencies over, uh, again, that costs more money. But if you do it collectively, you can save money. So there's so many good things to this, as long as it's done right. And so we have a good model here with CENCOM already. If we can duplicate that model and expand it, I think we'll do be very well. Uh, I've served on that committee for, I think, two and a half years now with Lake County. And uh, a lot of good pro progress on it, but again, some people that are pretty stuck in the mud that, no, we're gonna do it this way. Don't wanna change. Uh, the, a couple years ago, the state uh, changed the law showing that you had to reduce the number of uh, PSAPs, public safety uh, answering the facilities, uh, down to a half of what you have right now in a county. I think we had 19, so we have to get down to about 10 uh, by the end of the next year. And that hasn't happened yet. Uh, and they're based on the size of your organization. We have over, I think, 80,000 residents that we serve at CENCOM. So we, we're fine where we are right now. We don't have to do any consolidation. But there's a lot of places out there that, that have been struggling to, to get to that point. And uh, I hate to say that's going to push them along, but I, I think it will push them along. And I hope the, uh, the state, I know, was working on the new uh, 911 uh, cost. Uh, what would be for that, and I don't think that really went up though. I think it maintained at the same amount of money, like 87 cents instead yeah. of the dollar fifty. Right. And with the new equipment coming out that we're going to need to purchase, that's going to be expensive. Uh, back when we first opened up in the early 90s, I think we were charging 75 cents per phone line, and now we're only getting 87. So not a very big increase there. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of hard to stay on top of things when you're know, working on 12 cents. Right, right, exactly. No, I, I agree completely with the mayor, and I think um, CENCOM um, has been a great uh, model. I think they've been incredibly successful, and, and I think we need to see more of that around the state. Thank you very much. This question is for Representative Yingling. If you listen to both national, local media, and various cable news channels, it leads people to believe that the Republicans and Democrats don't agree on anything. Is this really the case? What are the items that have bipartisan support? Sure, uh, that, uh, that, that's a great question. The, um, I, think, I think when you look at the way the nation is right now is that it's viewed in a very polarized way. And I think a lot of that is perpetuated by something that the mayor brought up earlier, which is the 24-7 news yeah. cycle. And you, we, we have a media system now that's designed to feed us what we want to consume. So it's already designed and inclined to want to tell us what we already want to hear. So, you know, if you have more, you know, conservative leanings, you're probably watching Fox News, and more liberal leanings, probably watching MSNBC. I guess CNN is maybe somewhere in between. Um, and that is, in large part, I think, perpetuating this narrative that Republicans and Democrat elected officials do not get along. Um, the other, and that's simply not true, but another component to this, and this is something that is starting to be discussed at the, na at the national level, is the gerrymandering of districts. So in states that are controlled by Republicans, they do it. In states that are controlled by Democrats, they do it. And what they do is they gerrymander these districts to pack as many Republicans into one district, to pack as many Democrats into one district, to try and generate more seats for that specific party at the congressional level. Well, here's the problem with doing that, is the fact that if you pack a bunch of Republicans into a district, whoever is running in that district has to run to the right because the election is essentially the primary. They're gonna win the general election because there's so many Republicans in that district, so their big election is the primary, so they have to move further to the right. In districts where you dump and pack a bunch of Democrats, you know, the same principle applies to them, but they gotta move further to the left. So what ends up happening then is you elect someone who has run very far to the right, you elect someone who's run very far to the left, and now all of a sudden they gotta work together in Congress. And, um, and that's not, that doesn't create for a very rational dialogue at the congressional level. Um, and because you can't go back to your you very strong Republican or very strong Democratic districts and say, oh, hey, listen, I you know, have this great compromise with the Republican, or I have this great compromise with the Democrat. So that also perpetuates um, the narrative that Republicans and Democrats can't get along. 
Um, but that's not the overall case. Um, I think one of the um, biggest areas of agreement that you can just see at the state level was how Democrats and Republicans came together to solve the budget crisis. Um, that could not have been done without rank and file power of the Republicans and Democrats. There are a number of issues that, that legislators get along on. Um, I would say that in the House of Representatives, probably about 95, I would even say maybe as high as 98 percent of the issues that we vote on are huge, passed with huge bipartisan support. But the things that are covered in the media are maybe that 3 percent of very, um, of, I would say, um, you know, uh, hypercharged issues. And so that's what people see, and they, they see those, you know, that 3% of the issues that we're discussing, and they draw these conclusions that, you know, Republicans and Democrats can't get along, and that's just simply not true. Um, but I, I, think, I think a lot of it is perpetuated by um, the current structure of the media. And the gerrymandering, like you're talking about, it used to be that we would choose our elected officials. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, our elected officials are choosing their constituents by drawing their maps. Right. And it's just the opposite of the way it should be. It should be pretty balanced. You look at the quadrants, you, boom, there you go. Right. Not this stuff you got all this way and it'll stuff <laughs> out there, you know. <clears throat> People look at different maps and they say, oh, that looks like a snowman over there, you know, and it <laughs> makes no sense. Um, and it, it divides people and it, it makes it, like you said, you, you have polarization based on the way they draw those mm -hmm. districts so they can get the best for their own, their own parties rather than what's best for the people, so. Absolutely. There used to be, um, there used to be a congressional district that I believe um, that ran the entire west side of the state. Um, so it went right down the Mississippi River, but then it had all of these arms that shot into the central part of the state to grab various constituencies. And I think that that would be a great example yeah. of some, some very bad gerrymandering. The, um, this is something nationally that, that is gonna have to be dealt with because um, if we continue down this road of gerrymandering where you pack as many of one party into a district as possible, it's going to lead to absolute chaos. Um, back, in, you know, back when it was an evenly balanced district or an independent mm -hmm. district, you know, your elected official, you know, they had a lot of people to answer to. They, they, they had to take a more moderate stance. And working with the opposite party wasn't viewed as being a bad thing. It was actually viewed as being a really good thing mm -hmm. and something that people embraced and wanted to see more of. Yeah, I know they tried to pass that fair map, fair map amendment several times mm -hmm. on the ballot that has right. been unsuccessful. I think that would go a long way in helping to alleviate, at least in Illinois, the Absolutely. gerrymandering. So we can see what happens next time to try it. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this is a question for both of you, and it's a question we ask all of the elected officials who participate in the fireside chats. Why would a young person run for office when they see such discourse in today's political environment? We, well, it is difficult when they see, as you said, the news cycle only shows that 3% of all the battling. They don't show everything else that works out cooperatively. We need to, I guess, educate our young staff, our, you know, our kids in high school and in grade school even, that that's not how it is. And I talk to a lot of kids, uh, whether it be Boy Scouts or different classrooms, and I'm sure you do also, and you show them what you really do and how cooperative things are. And they don't understand that that's not what's on the news. How can it probably be that way? Well, the news is out there to make money nowadays. Years ago, the news wasn't supported by advertisers, nowadays they are. And that was one of the big mistakes they ever, they ever made uh, with the news cycle. Back when they were independent, they could say whatever had to be said, they had to worry about having somebody to pay for their salaries, and now they do. Uh, but what I tell the kids when I talk to them is the feeling you get out of helping people is like no other feeling you ever get. It's like helping your kids, but it's your residents. You do something for them, whether you uh, put a new road in, you, you change somebody's culvert, you clean out a gutter, uh, something so simple as that, it can be so heartwarming and, and it's just a great feeling that you help somebody else and that's why I do it. Yeah, right, you know, the, what's interesting is, you know, especially for, for younger people is that, you know, when you look at the demographic shifts, just, just the age shift going on right now in the nation is, you know, the baby boomers, um, you know, there's, there are fewer baby boomers now yeah. than there are of the younger generation. So you have an opportunity for people who are young, who are interested in shaping the world that they want to live in. Now is the best time for them to get involved because they are going to have a very strong voice in helping direct the, the you know, in helping um, direct the direction of the nation and also, you know, the state or your community. But, um, you know, 
I, I hate to t say it, Rich, but at some point you and I are, are going to be six feet in the ground, <laughs> and you know we're going to need a, we're going to need people to replace us. Yes. So, um, so that's why it's so important, I think, for the younger generation to um, to embrace public service and recognize that they can do something great for their community and great for their nation. Thank you. Well, we're getting close to our quitting time here. Uh, if I could maybe open up for a few questions and any questions on policy or what's going on in the village or the state. Just get the mic on here. Oh. Uh, this is for you, Rich. When you were talking about uh, ComEd, or not ComEd, uh, CENTCOM. Yes. How are they addressing the issue with people uh, dumping their landlines and going to their cell phones? Does that, it's got to affect your budget, doesn't it? Uh, it, it doesn't anymore, it used to, because uh, we got 75 cents per landline for many years and zero from the cell phone companies, except a few pennies. Now they've lumped it all together in the legislation, so for every line out there, we get, oh. we get money paid for that. And with the phase two that we put in years ago, we can put a cell phone down within probably 100 feet. So mm -hmm. if you're calling from your cell phone, no matter where you are, we can get really close to you. It used to be like a quarter mile, you know, <laughs> a huge area. Mm -hmm. Now we can tell almost exactly where you're at. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? How do younger parents do the rain? Pardon? How do younger parents do the fall of rain? Is it flood? The wet flood? The underpass. Underpass. Oh, underpass. Uh, you know, I wasn't over there. Uh, I, I drove all through the neighborhood. I didn't go through the underpass. Did, it did fine, Mayor. It did fine. Okay. The underpass did just as constructed. It was Thank not you. a problem for us. There's our chief of police, Gil Rivera. For questions. Yeah, the only time that flooded, <laughs> it, it flooded one time. That's when the guys were out there cutting the grass and the weeds, and they allowed them to accumulate block in the grates, so it could not drain. Other than that, it's never flooded. Cool. <laughs> well, thank you all for being here tonight. Really appreciate it. Yes, thank you very much. State for Representative. Yeah, always absolutely. give everyone a little, uh, a little pin for real oh, jolly beans. Oh, fantastic! Great. Thank you so much. And I, Sam and I have known each other for many, many years. I've known his family for many years, and it's a pleasure to have you here tonight. Thank, Thank you. you so much for having me. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you all everyone. so much for coming.